Good morning. Well, if you were here last week, you heard uh, Pastor Jeff's amazing, awesome, foundational sermon for this series. It was really good. And if you haven't heard it, you need to go listen to it. Um, but he referenced in the beginning of his sermon that he was a, a child or a youth of the 90s. And so, he, you know, the Tim LaHaye and all of the books, the Left Behind books and whatever. And um, I was a child, well, a teenager of the 70s. So we didn't have the nice, gentle books of the LaHaye's. We had the wonderful, fabulous movie, A Distant Thunder, which scared the living daylights out of every teenager when they came home and their parents were supposed to be home and they were not. And they were sure they were left behind. Is it still buzzy? Okay. Sorry. It's a thing. Anyway. Um. moving I need to take your plan of how you were going to not take the mark of the beast and survive so you could still go to heaven and I'm not someone who camps at all so that wasn't going to work for me I needed to go in the rapture that's that was my only way out so um you know many of us from that generation are uh we're scarred for life were any of you of that part of the generation I would, love them, I would love them to redo that movie now with all of the things you can do with a movie. Everybody would go to church, wouldn't they? <laughs> Is it a mess? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> also, I have to apologize. There's no notes online. I left my phone at home. And uh, a lot of times when we, do, we forget to do it, Tim and I put them on when we get here, and I left my phone. Everything's, I have nothing. I have no technology today. Which actually, you know what? It's kind of freeing. It's kind of nice, actually. I'm like, I'm not tempted to look at it or see who's doing what. I can just focus. So anyway, so I, that's my background. So like many people, I was afraid of this book because of that and like to shy away from it. And we still have people that kind of are like that. So I think it's important, though, because these, this, this second chapter that starts to address the churches is so necessary and important for our daily life in Christ. Because we are these churches. These words were not just sent to them. They're for all of us because we have these same issues. We deal with these same things. And so they're very, it's important for us to look at these churches, to look at our own lives, and to make sure that we are doing, um, after the rebuke comes, after the commendation of the rebuke comes the advice of what to do. We need to be practicing those things and doing those things. So I promise... Um, I'm not doing anything scary today. We're just going to look at the church in Ephesus. So if you have your Bible, we'll have to go old school. Uh, open your Bible or go to an app on your phone. So still some new school. And you can go to chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And uh, Pastor Jeff last week um, kind of set the tone and said, these are things that need to be read out loud. And I agree with that. So we're going to read this. We're going to read all seven verses. We're going to be fine. So... Um, Start with chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. And let's remember, let's take a little pause here and remember that even though John is the author and the writer, the, this is Jesus speaking to us and to the churches. So these, when you hear the I or you, it's him. That's who it is. It's Jesus. Yet I, Jesus, hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand, which is basically just your light and your influence, from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans were a, a mystery cult demonic group that liked to mix in some elements of Christianity. And later in this series, you'll get more information about them. So that's all I'm telling you, which I also hate. 
Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So can you imagine how the believers that make up the church of Ephesus must have felt about this rebuke? Because a rebuke, it certainly is. You can just see them listening to the commendation. Because I'm sure it was very exciting to get a letter and to open it up and to read it and to hear the news. And they're leaning in during the commendation. Uh, I, I value your hard work and your perseverance. I love that you cannot tolerate the wicked or false religions, that you've tested those who've tried to say they were apostles and they weren't, that you have pers persevered and endured hardship and you've not grown weary. I think that's an amazing thing because I think it's one thing to endure hardship. That in itself is pretty awesome. But if you can do it and not grow weary, I don't usually fall into that camp. If I'm enduring hardship, I want everybody to know and I am weary. And I want to be commended for my enduring and my weariness. You can imagine they were leaning in. And then when this rebuke comes and add in their history. Ephesus was a city well known in the province of Asia. It was where the trade route from the Euphrates ended and was noted for its great temples, especially the temple of Artemis. Considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It was beautiful, Ephesus. Widely known in, at that time for its Greek mystery cult religions and where Ephesus' charms were created and sold. I mean, not just Christianity, but all these religions kind of converged in this place. And the artifacts and the things that they used to worship those religions were there. So as beautiful as it was, it was also dark in the false teaching and in wrong teaching and false gods and all the stuff. And it had all the accoutrements that went with that. That's an incredible thing now. It was an incredible thing when Ephesus came and tried to infuse Christianity into that. But also just as strong was the evidence that a tremendous move of God had happened in Ephesus. Paul preached daily in the hall of Tyrannius for two years. Two years, Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. And the conversions were so profound that these Christians changed the city and the culture of Ephesus. Their influence was so profound through the authentic change they had experienced when they came to Christ that they changed the culture. That is an amazing thing, especially a culture filled with so much false religion and false teaching that they were able to turn that and change that. They changed the city and the culture. This city was full of religions, which makes the influence of this church even more profound. This church becomes the flagship of the early churches, so much so that many of the leaders of the time come here for prolonged periods of time. Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos, to name a few, and Timothy of the do not let them put you down for your youth fame is the pastor of this church. This is where John lived for many years before the Isle of Patmos. This is a flagship church that has done amazing things, changing the culture making a home and a place for the Christian leadership of that time to gather and meet. Can you imagine the conversations taking place around the tables? This was a mighty church. These are the real deal kinds of believers. And they have done amazing things in Ephesus. These are people of substantive faith who were truly transformed in their acceptance of Christ and are now being rebuked for having left, and the word is left, not lost or forgotten, but left, because the Greek word is abandoned, and that's what it means, left, their first love. Not fell out of or lost, but the word denotes choice. A choice of leaving their first love. How could this happen in such an amazing place? where there had been an obvious move of God. First, let's clarify one issue. This is not an abandonment of their faith. 
They are still strong believers and followers of Christ. They have simply traded theology, doctrine, theoretical facts of salvation, Christian activity, and service as the beginning place of their faith, instead of what should have been the starting place of our faith, which is our love for Christ and the daily bread which we need to sustain a healthy, growing, authentic love relationship with Christ. They had abandoned their first love of Christ, but not the lifestyle or the discipline of Christianity. It's a subtle shift of what should come first. So they didn't go all pagan. That's not what we're talking about here. What it is, is a, sh- a subtle shift of where does my relation, where is the root of my relationship of Christ come from? What is the root or the foundational place in which I serve and which I walk in relationship with him? And instead of it playing that loving place of relationship, loving him first and everything being born out of that, it is now kind of shifted into this, we are the false religion hunters. And they were proud of their stance and they were proud of what they did. Well, is taking a stand against false religions a good idea for the church? Well, yes, of course. But the root of why you do it and how you do it, big deal. Because a hand extended and a hammer are two different things. This is not uncommon in all human long-term relationships, but none so clearly as marriage. What starts as a passionate love relationship where you cannot even bear to think of living without each other and for which you will make all kinds of lifestyle changes turns into the business of marriage where running a home and a family becomes more important than the original relationship that created the family in the first place. I've often said uh, to, when Tim and I are talking to leaders or we're teaching to leaders or we're meeting with leaders, This very simple truth that's very important. Everything you do in ministry as a couple needs to start start from and come from the marriage. The marriage has to be first. The marriage relationship has to be first. And then what you do and what you practice and how you serve and how you pastor or how you lead comes out of that. Because let's just say this. If there's no marriage, there's no what? There's no ministry. So everything must come out of that relationship first. But often in marriage, what happens in long-term marriages is the business of the marriage, the business of the family takes over the loving relationship that started the whole thing in the first place. Sometimes I say to young parents, you got to make sure you're having time for just the two of you. You got to go on dates. You got to you got to keep that love relationship going. Well, I, we don't have time and we can't afford it and we can't You know what? You can't not afford it. Everything comes out of it. Everything's born out of it. In long-term relationships, we have to keep coming back to the origins of beginning, of love, of connection, of relationship. Because what happens when people don't do that, their kids leave and they're left with just the two of them and they're looking at each other like, now what do we do? I'm not sure I even like you anymore. Is it not true? We've all experienced it. We've all seen it. We've all watched it happen. Long-term relationship requires a continual returning. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But a continual returning to the origin of the relationship. And the rebuke that this church is getting is, you've gotten so busy and so into being the people against the false religions that you've forgotten why you started doing that in the first place which it was out of your love and commitment to me your need for me the priority of first love if left abandoned in the gradual slow is the gradual slow change of priorities good works responsibilities busyness battles for what is right disappointments and the list goes on and on and on and on and on But when this subtle shift happens in our relationship with the Lord, what is the outcome? 
Well, some of the few outcomes look like relationship becomes requirement. Self-righteousness reigns. Criticism replaces kindness. Empathy, compassion, and forgiveness become judgment. Because, you know, it's really easy when you don't do all those dark, ugly things to sit back and go, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. When I compare myself to others, listen, I'm a firstborn daughter of a preacher's kid. There are sins I don't even know about. You know, I've been a good girl all my life. A little sarcastic, maybe. But I've been a good girl all my life. There's stuff that goes on in the world that I don't even know happens. I wouldn't even know how to find it. So when I compare myself sometimes, you know, I can feel pretty good. I never did that. I never did that. I never did that. I never did that. But when I compare myself to Jesus, we got a long way to go. Self-righteousness can become huge when we lose sight of that moment when we realized we were a sinner and that we needed the grace of Jesus. There's nothing more humbling, there's nothing more real than that moment when you're going, I need to accept Jesus as my savior or I'm not going to heaven. I'm not gonna live, I'm, not, I'm a sinner. That moment is so beautiful and it's so humbling and we need to come back to it. And that's what's being told to this church. Yes, you've done amazing things, no, no doubt. No question. But if you lose the place from which it comes, harshness follows. Harshness follows. What is being lost is so crucial to these believers that the rebuke comes like cold water in their face. The rebuke is clear and straightforward because they need to look at what they are doing and how it will affect them because the change is often so subtle. They need to be shaken a little bit as we do sometimes, to look at what's really happening, what's really going on. Sometimes it's the subtle shift in our attitude, the subtle shift in our choices, the subtle shift in our behavior that has way more long-term damage. Because often it gets way down the road before we even know we need to do something about it which is what I'm sure was happening to these people, these believers and others are like, what are you talking about? And then they had to sit in it and they had to look at it and they had to go, oh, oh. But here's the thing about God. Here's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't just hold the mirror up to make us be in pain. He's not cruel, he's not mean. He holds the mirror up because he always has a solution. Yes, that haircut doesn't look good on you, but we can fix it. It's fixable. He holds up the mirror to show us where we are so we can begin again, so we can repent and start again. That's what I love about being a Christian is there's always a backup plan. In other religions, when you mess up, you mess up. But in this religion, when you mess up, you just confess your sin. And guess what? You get a do-over. You get a hundred million do-overs. Because he is gracious. And he understands our weak, how weak we are. All is not lost. They and we are given clear direction. Repent and return. Which stands out, I think, from that scripture, so in, it's in verse 4. You have forsaken the love you had, you had at first, and then in verse 5. But this is what you need to do. Repent and do the things you did at first. There is a way back. It's two-pronged. We repent, and then we return to the things we did at first. Repentance is necessary. It's the starting place. The definition for repent from the dictionary is the activity of reviewing one's actions and feeling contrite or regret for past wrong, which accompanied by commitment to and actual actions that show or prove a change for the better. Repentance is not, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. When my students do something um, really disrespectful or really ugly or really nasty, I just stop and I just, I look at them and I say, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. You can apologize for what you just said and what you just did, 
or I can write you up and send, send you down to the office. What would you like to do? And usually what I get is, fine, fine, because they're not really sorry, but they don't want to go to the office. So then I go, well, that's not going to work for me because that's not an apology. So would you like to try it again? And then usually I'll get something that at least feels somewhat real. I know they still just don't want to go to the office. But repentance has to have action to it. It has to have the intention. The, in Isaiah uh, chapter 1, verse 16, 20, we have kind of a mirror or a mimic verse here of what we see in Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. But it's the Lord telling us what we have to do when we're repenting. I think I have this passage. I don't, I'm not sure. But it, Isaiah 1, 16 through 20. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's really clear. Because here's what we do. So I can just imagine that there were people in Ephesus when they read, when they heard this, like me, who are like me, who went, well, I'm not doing that. I love Jesus. And that's why the rebuke is so strong. Look at your heart. Look at your mouth, mind, brain, body, everything that makes you up. Look at that. What are you doing? And the call is to repent. Because if we do, then what is scarlet? We will be made whole and pure and clean. It is a clear and simple command to repent. Acknowledge where you are. Recognize the need for repentance. Evaluate any subtle changes that have taken place and repent for letting it happen and recognize that cha changes must be made. A commitment to change must now happen. You know, I think the longer you walk with the Lord, sometimes the less authentic, I'll just talk for me, sometimes the less authentic my repentance is. You know, I'll be going on my way and I'll feel that little <clears throat> from the Holy Spirit. That's not good. Shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have done that. That wasn't Jesus. And you just kind of go, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just, uh, I'll just be really nice to that person next time I see him. And we think that that's going to cut it. But it doesn't. Not with the person or with the Lord. <laughs> because if you really feel bad... If you really feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you own it, then you make it right. You have to go back and say, I apologize for what I said. It wasn't, that was, it was inappropriate and I'm sorry. What, what can I do to make it right? Repentance requires acknowledgement. And like any long-term relationship, it is the tendency of human beings to get lazy. It just is. We like, we like comfort. We like ease. We like a cruise control. It's, it's our default. It's our default. And we don't go back and take the steps we need to take in relationships. And that's why relationships sometimes deteriorate. Because we don't respond with all the steps. You need all the steps. For it to be right, you need all the steps. Evaluate any subtle changes that you have taken place and repent for letting it happen and recognize that changes must be made. A commitment to change must now happen. So the first part, he tells them, you have to repent. Once that is done, now we move on to returning to the things we did at first. This is not the emotion of first love because that always changes. Either it fades because it's just simply attraction or chemical or it deepens and becomes foundational if it's real. He's not saying to return to how you first felt when you came to Christ, but return to what you did 
when you first came to Christ because of love. What you did, your actions. How did your life change? What did you do differently? You know, when you hear that, when you feel that first smitten feeling to the person you've now been married to forever and you can't even remember what that feeling feels like, but you know that first feeling? You're willing to change everything, right? You don't go to chapel with your hair just out of bed. You get up and you get, because oh, I dated in Bible college, so that's my reference point. But you get up, you take, well, I never did that anyway because, you know, again, I was a child in the 70s. But this generation likes to do that. You don't do that. You get up, you take a shower, you do your hair. You pick your outfit, the one that makes you look the skinniest. You make sure that when you're looking good and you're walking down the aisle of the chapel that he gets a whiff of that perfume and sees you. Right? There are things you do when your heart goes boom, 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 boom. You don't just, there are things you do. You make sure you're in the right place at the right time. Or you change your behavior to line up with something they're doing. All those things. There are actions we do when we feel those feelings. It's the same thing when we come to Christ. How do we change our life when we accept him as our personal savior? And now this is the life we're going to walk. This is the journey we're going to take. What are those things we do in the early days? Well, we worship in gratitude for all the good gifts that come with salvation. Nobody has to tell you to raise your hands or, in, or enter in or be a part of the worship. You're there. I, am, I was a sinner and I'm saved by grace and I am grateful. We have actions. You make changes in your life. You're willing to let go of some things that compete or distract from your new love of Christ. When you first come to Christ, there are things you do to make room for him. You go to church. You, you start looking at your friendships and evaluating what are healthy ones and what aren't. Who do I need to be with? Where can I get mentored? Where, who can I fellowship with? Who can help me grow? You start making changes. You want to know more and grow in your knowledge of Christ. So you study, you read the Bible, you pick up things, you look at things. You want to share your foundation, your faith with others. You tell other people about him. And the warning to the church is to return to these actions out of love for him. I saw this firsthand in the church where I accepted Jesus. Now, I was eight, year old, eight years old when I accepted the Lord. So I didn't have a big life of sin behind me. But, and I already went to church every time the doors were open. I already had worship music in my house. I already read the Bible because I'd been to Bible camp and I, was told, I learned how to read, you know, have a little devotions. I already knew how to do all that stuff. But the church where I actually accepted Christ had a revival in it that changed the area. My great aunt was a pastor in a small Assembly of God church in Chico, California. My great uncle had died. I never met him. I never knew him. And they had started the church together. And she just felt like she needed to continue doing that. And when I was eight, we moved back home. My dad had finished two years of Bible college and had his license. And we moved back home to help her, to assist her. And our church consisted of a very small group of people. It was very traditional. Um, we, we, in the old days in the Assembly of God Church, before Sunday school, you would come in and have kind of an opening exercises. And you would give away pencils to people whose birthday it was. And then you would go off to Sunday school and then you'd go off to church. And it was very traditional. But my aunt had invited an evangelist to come and speak. And he came. And uh, in those days, revivals happened during the weeknight. And you came to church night after night after night. And we did that. And all of a sudden, off the street, still, how it happened and why it happened, we still don't really even know. But college kids from Chico State started coming to the revivals at night. And they walked into the church, many of them, out of their minds. LSD, heroin, all the drugs of the time. I mean, it was, the, you know, it was, the, it was the 60s, late 60s. Some of them had hair so long, filthy and dirty, you couldn't see their face. Rag, filthy clothes. Many of them came from very wealthy homes, but they had turned, you know, their back on the man and that upbringing and were in communes and engaged in all kinds of behavior. And they walked into the church, just almost unrecognizable, some of them. Waif thin, because they didn't eat. 
because when you do drugs, you don't always eat, and just lost, lost. And because church went on forever in those days, my brother and I would be laying underneath the first pew, you know, head to head, messing with each other, watching everything that was going on. And we saw these kids come into church and they would get, the service would end and the evangelist and my dad and my aunt, they would get up down on the altar and if you wanted prayer, you could come down for prayer. And we watched these young people come to the altar and accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And many of them were immediately healed, put back in their right mind, like how the demoniac is referred to in the New Testament, put back in their right mind and left completely different than they came. And they would come back the next night, showered, haircut, clean clothes. We didn't know who they were. My dad and my mom and my aunt and other people in the church would say, welcome, is this your first time? I was here last night in the altar. You prayed for me, remember? And I was healed. I'm not crazy anymore. They didn't, some of them never went through withdrawals. Some of them were immediately freed from the drug addiction right then. It was unbelievable. And they left everything they had been doing before. We had worship that I cannot even describe to you. It was so beautiful and so different than what was traditional at the time. But there were guys that wouldn't play their electric guitar. And my dad loves a good electric guitar. So he was like, why won't, and they were gifted, some of them gifted musicians, why won't you play your guitar? I played, my, I played that for the devil. I'm not playing it for Jesus, I played that for the devil. And we're like, but we really need an electric guitar. They didn't want anything to do with the life they had lived before because they had been authentically saved, healed, delivered. And they told everybody. And for nights on end, college kids came and were saved and delivered and healed. And I watched that from underneath the seat. And finally, at a communion service on a Sunday night, I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to feel that. I wanted to know him the way they knew him. And besides that, a few weeks earlier, my little dog, my little Pekingese was sick and was going to die. And I'd gotten in the line for prayer. And the evangelist prayed for my Pekingese. And when we got home, he was healed. Lived another 10 years with my grandmother. So I gave my heart to Jesus at that communion service. I wanted what those kids had. Their shiny faces full of the love of Jesus was so contagious. Love is contagious. Return. Return to the love, to the actions of love that you did at the first. Return to those things. Now, I wanted to just share with you a few things that we can do to return. Um, and so that's the next place we're going to go is to remind and remember. Now, if you've noticed, all my points start with an R. I'm teaching alliteration next week, and I think it seeped into my sermon. Uh, if you don't know, alliteration is when you use words that all start with the same sound or the same uh, letter. In the last year, we have spent so much time surviving, processing, and experiencing questions of faith, truth, and God's authority and power in our world. It would be easy to forget our first love because we get caught up in defending it and we forget to live it. As we shout what we believe to be right and scream what we think people need to do, we forget that we're supposed to be sharing him from a place of love. It's easy. It's easy to be provoked as a Christian in the world we live in today. It's very easy. The delight, the joy, the excitement of discovering a love so profound that heals us and makes us whole from the inside out and when we don't share it from a place of love, we are experiencing what God says will happen. Our lamp stand will go out. And our light and our influence will go out. In a long-term relationship, it is always about continually returning, continually returning to the actions at first. That is what we're supposed to be doing. There are so many things we can do to return to the action of first love, but here are three that I find to be extremely helpful for me in the present circumstance I find myself in. The first one is to remind yourself to ask for help. 
dependence deepens relationship. We are so caught up in wanting to not be codependent, which is not good, but we forget that dependence is a part of a healthy relationship. And we forget that we're supposed to be dependent on God. We forget there's a place for that. In the last few years, I began doing a quite simple thing in my relationship with God. When I feel overwhelmed or unsure of what the next move should be, I simply say, please help me, I don't know what to do. Now, I believe in devotions. I believe in fasting and prayer. I believe in all the biblical disciplines and have practiced them in my life. But I'm going to be really honest with you. This last little thing that I've been starting to do has helped me more than anything else in the world has helped me. When I'm, in a situ- when I'm walking into a situation that I know could be dicey, and I just say, I can't do this without you. I need your help. When I know provocation is walking towards me, on Friday morning, I was out at duty. These two people were walking for, to, towards me, and I knew that I was going to be provoked beyond what I really wished to be uh, able to handle on my own. And I just said, Jesus, I need your help. Help me not say what's going to go through my brain. Help me not do what I really want to do. Please help me look like you and not like the me that looks nothing like you. Please help me. What surprises me is when he does exactly what I've asked him to do. I feel this burst of love and gratitude. I just feel delighted every time I realize that I asked and he did it exactly what I asked for and he showed up to help me. I was excellent on Friday morning. I didn't even respond to the provoking in any way. I was lovely. And I can tell you that was not me. That was Jesus in me. And even later in the day, I had an opportunity to help one of the provocateurs, and I did so gratefully and happily. Why? Because I asked for help, and he showed up. You know, sometimes we get stuck in the rituals. You know, you have your devotions in the morning, and then you kind of put God on the shelf, and off you go. That's not how it's supposed to work. It's a relationship, which means he's always present. He's always there. I can say... In a staff meeting, Jesus, please help me shut my mouth. Because I really, you know, you know. Please. Lord, give me infinite patience because I need them right now. Please help me respond in a way that has long-term benefit and not short-term feel good, but lots of consequence connected to it. Help me. Help me. Help me. I've just begun to live my life like this. Help me. Please help me. Help me do what you would have me do. Help me say what you would have me say. Help me respond the way you want me to respond. And every time I do that, and every time he shows up to help me, what I feel is love and gratitude. I feel love and gratitude that I didn't blow a relationship up. I feel love and gratitude that I don't have to go back and apologize. I really feel a lot of gratitude about that. I feel love and gratitude for the Jesus that comes to me when I call and ask him for help. It keeps that loving relationship fresh and new. Dependence, healthy dependence does that for us. Help. Please help me. I remind myself of who he is to me when I ask him to help me. Secondly, Remember what he has done before and remind yourself of who he's always been to you. In our current culture, there is an attack on Christianity and a metamorphosis of Christianity at the same time. If we're not being blamed for hate because we believe in sin and we know that the boundaries and guidelines that are necessary for human beings and choosing to align ourselves with those things makes us, to some people, hateful. We have that whole thing going on. Or we have within the church, sections of the, fractions, fractions I'll say, of the church. We have the deconstructing of faith. We have the deconstructing of Jesus. We have the deconstructing of the Bible. We have the deconstructing of the deconstructing. I'm sick of the word deconstructing. I don't even want my pie deconstructed. I just want chocolate cream pie in a crust. 
Is that too much to ask? But it's so vogue and so hip and so cool to deconstruct everything. So it's sometimes hard in the middle of all of that, you're a hater or you don't have any um, spiritual maturity because you don't know how to deconstruct things. In the middle of those two things, it can become confusing. It can make your head spin. And when people you love or admire embrace those things, it can create doubt and confusion in your heart. When someone you have, a, you have followed and respected or admired makes that kind of choice, it's really hard to process that and to deal with that. When people you love make those choices, it's hard to process it and deal with that. Scripture says in Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We are the very elect, those of us who have accepted Jesus. And let me tell you something, false prophets can look remarkably familiar. Mix a little truth or alter the truth just a little bit to make something acceptable and you have something that's not what it's supposed to be. There's nothing new under the sun. The church at Ephesus were so committed to fight against the false doctrine and so engaged in that activity that it replaced their sheer love of God. Any strength overdone becomes a, wi a weakness. And this is true when we're evaluating things and we're looking at things and we're trying to understand. I'm all for, I believe that we need to look at our doctrine and our theology and we better make sure it lines up with scripture and we better make sure that we deliver it in, from a place of love and kindness. I'm all for evaluating that and looking at the things that maybe the church has not done well. And let's be honest people, the church has done some things not well. I believe in self-reflection and evaluation. I think it's important. But I also think we need to remind ourselves and of, what, of who God is and what he, who he has been to us always and who he is to us now. I was driving to work a few months ago and I was just swirling in a sea of all these kinds of thoughts. I could just kind of feel the oppressive lives, lies of the enemy kind of entering my space. And it was just a lot. It was just a lot. And I, was, I had worship music on really low, but I was just in that space, just messing with my head, thinking through these things. And all of a sudden, this little song from my childhood began to cut through those thoughts. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. And I just begin to say out loud to the Lord, you are true. Your word is true. And I know this because I have lived it. I have seen your truth. I have lived your truth. I have benefited from your truth. You have walked with me all the days of my life. You were here, and you were here, and you were here, and you were here, and I don't care what anybody else says. I know you're true, and I know your word is true. And if no one else goes, I'm still going. Because I'm a dance with the one who brung you kind of girl. Because when I look at the lonely patches of my life, the challenging patches of my life, the difficult road in different seasons, you know who is consistently there? Jesus. In the hands of a human being, or in the precious, pres in his precious presence, or in his word, or in the music, or in, he's there. Every single time I look back, he is the consistent, consistent, consistent presence of my life. And it brings me back to that place. It brings me back to that little eight-year-old girl who wanted that relationship, who wanted a shiny face, who wanted to live for Jesus. 
He's walked this life with me every step of the way. So you can deconstruct away. I'm just going to keep walking this constructed road. I'm going to keep living what I know is true. And I'm going to keep speaking the truth no matter what. I was referencing, I was talking, I was texting a um, colleague who was uh, in a bargaining situation. And it's been tumultuous and difficult and cantankerous and ugly and all the bad things. It's been mostly just all the bad things. And he's had to be in those meetings. He's not someone I know really well, but um, getting to know well. And he sent me a text. He goes, here's where we are. He goes, we can't say anything yet, but here's kind of where we are. And we're going to be back at the table and do whatever. And I sat on my, with my phone. I said, okay, Jesus, here we go. I said, I'm sorry you have to do all of that, but I'm a person of faith. I don't know if you know that, and I'll be praying for you. I didn't get any answer or any response to my text. But that doesn't change who I am. That doesn't change what I know is true. And if anybody needs Jesus, it's somebody going into a collective bargaining com committee trying to negotiate a contract. didn't change who I am. And it reminds me of why I am who I am because of his love for me. And it takes me back to all those places of love and relationship and commitment that I have walked my whole life with Jesus. All right, last but not least. I'm gonna try to get you out of here before 11.30 if I can. Number three, remember to stack the stones. Joshua 4. You got to stack the stones. So in Joshua, they have to cross over into the promised land. Big old thing, body of water. You can call it whatever you want in the way. And they got to get to the other side. And the Ark of the Covenant has to get to the other side. And they all got to get to the other side. Men, women, children, babies, everybody. And they take the Ark of the Covenant, the water of parts. And they all go across on dry land. And Joshua is given the direction from the Lord. You're going to take 12, every tribe is going to bring a stone. We're going to do 12 stones right here. We're going to stack them for this purpose, Joshua 4. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever for what God did for them in that moment, in that day. The stacking of stones is a reminder of the power and faithfulness of God to us. It's the decisive practice of gratitude to the Lord for his hand on our behalf, and it takes us back to our love relationship with him. It is the telling of the stories that our love is stirred up. Gratitude always refreshes love, both in emotion and actions. Gratitude always stirs up love, both in emotion and actions. My, son, my oldest son, Michael, and his wife, for the last three or four years, have been, went through several really challenging situations, one after the other. My son is a warrior. He stands tall, and he is immovable in his faith. He is immovable in what is right. He's just built for it. But about a year and a half ago, I, I was sitting in my living room, and all of a sudden, I just felt him. I can always just feel this kid. I don't know. There's, I don't know what it is, but I can just feel when something's not right. So I picked up my phone, and I called him. And I said, Bud, are you okay? He goes, not really, Mom. He goes, I just got another rejection on a job, and I don't know what to do, and I, you know, whatever. So I pulled out one of my big stacking stone stories, you know, a big one. I got lots of them. And I picked it out and I started telling the story and he interrupted me in the middle. He goes, Mom, I don't really need one of your stories right now. What I need is I need God to show up. Because if he doesn't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, all right, bud, I'll save my story, but I'm going to tell you something. God always shows up. And I've told you this many times in your life, but I'm going to say it again. The nose 
lead to the yes. The no's always lead to the yes. Now, it's really hard when you're in a cycle of no's to believe that God even knows where you are. But the no's always lead to the yes. And it wasn't long when the miraculous provision started to come. And in the last year, last six months, I would say, more and more provision has come their way. More and more opportunity. Things have just, the things have opened up. And just a few weeks ago, they moved out of his in-law's house into their own apartment. And my daughter-in-law got a job for which she had been looking for a very long time. That she can do at home so she can be at home with the girls. And, a few, and they, we helped him move. And he, they were putting up all the stuff. And I helped to organize everything. Well, the kitchen. I got to boss my son around for like two hours free. Because I was asked in. <laughs> and, and then they continued to do things. And a few maybe a couple weeks after that, my son posted um, a little movie he had made that I wanna take the time to show you because it's doing just this, it's stacking the stones. And what I found so amazing about it is that he had connected all the dots. He had in his life all of the difficult challenges and no's and he had connected all the dots and this was the outcome that had come from them. And it was so, powerful and moving that I decided I want to share it with you today. So we'll just take a couple of minutes to watch that and then we'll wrap things up, I promise. In a cozy little two-bedroom apartment, tucked away in a nondescript complex in unincorporated Sacramento County, there is this. My one blank wall. Off to one side lives the various storage containers for my children's toys, hastily picked up after a day's worth of play and imagination. The other side bears the battle scars of the Great War of Dinner. Stacks of hand wash only dishes are placed to dry beside the sink in a never ending cycle of wash, dry, use, repeat. This wall is an important wall. It's the first thing you see when you walk in. It keeps watch over the most used, most loved room in the whole apartment, our living room. The majority of our free time is spent right here, sitting under this wall. Since we moved in, we put at least one thing on almost every wall, except for this one. We decided to reserve this space for something special, a reminder. Since 2018, we've had to walk through several difficult seasons. From a job loss and worrying about whether we have enough money for baby formula to searching for a place where we could live on our own amidst a worldwide pandemic. I feel like we compressed a decade of life experience into three years. When you're going through a difficult season, it's hard to remember. Remember the difficult seasons you've survived before it's hard to believe that God will lead you through this season just as he did way back then. We've come to the other side of this difficult season and God proved himself trustworthy and faithful yet again. Looking back now, we see the little adjustments he made to our path to protect us, guide us, and bless us. In Genesis 28, Jacob has this dream He's running from his brother right after tricking him out of his birthright. In the dream, God makes Jacob several promises, one of which is that he will be with him and never leave him. When he wakes up, Jacob builds a stone monument that he plans to return to, a physical reminder of the promises God made him. So that's what we're gonna do with this wall. Two photos that remind us that God will be with us and that he will always keep his promises. One, a reminder of an anniversary trip that the year before this would have seemed so far out of reach. 
one that represents the city that I wanted to call home again. These photos now watch over our living room so that the next time we're kicking against the current, just trying to breathe, all we have to do is look up and remember. There's a lot of really cool ways to stack stones now. He was at our, we were all together uh, last week because it was my birthday, and um, we were talking about his little movie, and um, I said to him, so you remember when I called you and you said, you just need a God to show up? Has God shown up, son? He goes, well, duh, mom, that's what the movie's all about. Stacking stones are good reminders, good ways to take us back to that first love. Because I don't know if you remember your first miraculous answer to prayer. But that first one's a really big one, isn't it? You pray for something, you believe for something, and God shows up and gives you an answer. And you're like, this is really real. This is really true. His word is really true. And there's the excitement and the beauty of that first moment, that first time he really answers a prayer for you. And when we stack stones, it, oh, it takes us back to those first actions, those first memories of experiencing his provision on our behalf, his answering the prayer on our behalf. It's important to return to our first love. It's important to remember why we accepted him in the first place, why we changed our life and made room for him as our savior. It's important to go back to that place of love because then we remember to make everything we do come out of that place, not a place of self-righteousness, not a place of judgment, not a place of what we don't do but out of a place of what we do do. Because he first loved us, we can love him. And our love for him then motivates all of our behavior, all of our actions, everything we do. That's what he's saying here in Ephesus. Return to that. And if you do, you will have long lasting life, eternal life with him. That's the promise and your lampstand will shine brightly. You will be a light, you will be an influence, you will be a beacon in the darkness. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be a beacon than the darkness. And when we return to our first love, that gives us the ability to do that. I'm just gonna close in prayer today and let you go because I've kept you long. But I just hope that as you go through this week, maybe you would take some of these scriptures. I didn't read Mark 12. It talks about loving him with, with our, all of our heart, our mind, soul, and spirit. But you can do that on your own. Maybe take a little walk this week. Stack some stones. Remember who he's been to you when he's been with you. Remind yourself to ask for help when you need it. And return once again to your first love. Return once again to that moment when you first said yes to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your mighty, mighty, mighty power. That you have made provision for us to have a relationship with you. And that you are always there when we return and when we come back. And when we repent and we recognize that we have wandered afar and we return, you welcome us with open arms, like the father and the prodigal son. You're always there waiting to come back to this moment of love and the actions we did at the first. Remind us, remind us to do it. Remind us to remember to come back to you. Thank you for this rebuke and thank you for the, the um, way back that you provide. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you. Be with us this week. Help us speak from love, act from love, make decisions from love, and behave in love. 
in Jesus' name.